exactly, but if I like stumble across words and whatnot, don't, uh, don't mind it. <laughs> um, thank you for having me today. Um, and I actually, no, briefly, uh, perhaps you have seen my name before. Oh, you, you may not, but at least I know Joe, and at least I know Richard from, oh, I've seen you in person for the first time now, also you, Joe, but I know uh, some of you guys from the community. And um, my name is Casper Tideman, uh, and uh, I am a software developer, and I work for uh, a startup, which is my own. I'll get back to that. Uh, I like to be nice and drink beer. And uh, I work out of uh, Copenhagen, uh, which is where I'm from, obviously, and San Francisco, uh, the latter being a great place for, for Ember.js meetups and everything. Not just Ember.js, because everybody knows everybody in that city, so everything web-related, actually. Um, I also do blogging, and you may have uh, stumbled upon my caspertideman.com, aptly named uh, website. I blog about a lot of things, um, but mostly Ember.js, and I like to keep my blog posts short and simple, so that's kind of like my style. Um, and also, uh, I, uh, I hang out a lot in San Francisco with the Ember uh, JS team. So this is Tom Dale and, and me after a fun night uh, of uh, doing a meetup at Zendesk. And this is Casanova's uh, in, I don't know where it is actually. I can't really recall, but uh, that was a good night. And um, so if you ever go to San Francisco, uh, be sure to, if you can, be sure to time it so that you get to uh, attend the meetup. It's, it's, it's really fun and it's really giving, not just uh, drinking wise. Uh, <laughs> so, um, what do I do? What do I do? Uh, I have a, uh, a company called Mimo, which is a, uh, uh, a social network for writing and, and sharing memos. I just call them Mimos. Um, so, that is comprised of a lot of different, well, components obviously, and a lot of different data types. I've got users and uh, screen names and, 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 and events and comments and notifications and activities and all sorts of things. So um, the reason why I tell you this is when I talk about offline mode and what that is, um, I talk about it in, in the context of this uh, system. So, um, so it's not that I, I've been working with offline mode in a simple manner. I've been working with it for a year now or so in, in, in what has become a very uh, complex uh, manner, yeah, so um, let's, um, this is not Ember JS specific per se, uh, I mean offline mode is not, but we need to get a bit of perspective on, on, on this whole thing that, that, that we're going to talk about, um, because in the beginning uh, we just had, well we still have that, but we just had HTTP and um, request response and that was great, so we would um, ask for a resource and that would be rendered and send over the wire and, 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 and being pretty static really. And then came the rise of, of, of JavaScript essentially, which is why we're here, which was, well, as you know, named Web 2.0. And, 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 and with that, we sort of made the staticness dynamic. We sort of worked against the, the, the core principle of, of, the, of the protocol even. Um, well, not necessarily that, but at least the way that it was thought to work at the time. And along with JavaScript and the maturity maturing and the standards groups maturing as well and, 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 and um, venturing into this whole Web 2.0 and onwards thing uh, came um, a bunch of interesting things because at some point somebody raised a hand and said, uh, how about offline storage? Since we can now, uh, since we cache a bunch of stuff anyway on, on the client, wouldn't it be nice if we could store uh, data as well? And not just session cookies, right? But actual data on the client. And so emerged um, local storage and WebSQL and IndexedDB. Uh, the, the, the first one still being uh, used, the middle one being sort of like, they attempted like fade it out and IndexedDB being the thing. So the status quo is that we, now have a uh, a tool set, JavaScript, and a bunch of nice tools for that, including uh, frameworks such as Ember.js, and we got 
like these possibilities that have been around there for a while uh, for supporting offline mode. So this is not necessarily a new thing. Now, while it may not be a new thing, it's certainly controversial. And uh, this is just to get the context right in terms of the community here, because uh, this is not something that I usually talk about a lot because I mean, like, top two started, started JavaScript flame war. It's got to be uh, post something stupid to Hacker News and, and like, upvote it or, or mention offline mode because you're, you're going to get people from, from, from either uh, side just jump in and, and start fighting you fiercely. Uh, and the fellow uh, Dane uh, David, uh, or DHH, I, I guess you would call him that, yeah, um, he hates it. He, he just hates it. <laughs> and actually, this is, uh, this is a conversation in which he talks about the fact that we don't need offline mode because people are always online. Uh, and, and, and the good Paul Chavard, which is, uh, he's an emberist too, or emberenio, uh, he tries to defend it, but you cannot really do that with David. I will, I will say that, um, he, he, so he's, he's like... Uh, saying that you are always online and if you are not always online you will only be offline for very brief periods of time but i mean i've been offline now for i don't know four hours or whatever and half of my apps on this phone even the native ones they don't work so even though he disagrees i think uh i think this is an interesting field to explore and that's what we're going to do um so so basically um Besides the fact that images and stuff are, are being cached, what, 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 what we have essentially right now is the ability to define a cache manifest. This has got nothing to do with Ember.js, but I'll get to the Ember part. Uh, it's just important to mention this. We got the ability to put a cache manifest, which is just a text file on, the, um, uh, on our web server uh, and, and point to it in the HTML document that gets spit out from the server. And in this manifest will be listed all resources that are to be cached or all, all resources that are specifically not to be cached, including uh, network requests. If you just cache everything, it, it'll explode and, um, and, and fail over. So that's what a, a cached manifest contains. I, I actually don't have an example of it, but it's really simple. It's just a text file. And given that we have that client side, well, in order to make this really work in terms of uh, working with offline data and not just assets, we need some kind of storage library. I mean, we got IndexedDB, which is like uh, a, a set of instructions, but we still need to, to treat it in some way, so we need that. And if we got a cache manifest and some kind of library, uh, we're offline. Well, in, in theory, at least, because it takes a little more than that. Um, so if you have a cache manifest, what will happen is that once you uh, refresh the page or whatever you, uh, you hit it up, uh, it'll, uh, it'll show you, this is the, uh, obviously the Chrome Web Inspector uh, thing, and it'll show you uh, everything that it's caching. And um, this is just a side note. If, um, how, how do you make it recache? Well, you just change the uh, cache manifest. And what, what you usually do is you just timestamp it somewhere at the bottom of it. So just put another timestamp in after you've compiled all your new assets and every browser will figure out that this one is newer than the one I previously had and it'll reload all the assets. But anyway, this is how it looks. And um, as you can see, uh, Mimo caches, not a lot. It, you can't see that because it starts to cache all the locale files, but it, it, it caches jQuery and Fay and the app and handlebars and got a fine uploader thing and stuff. So that's, that's sort of the assets part. Um, that's all the static assets that we want for the browser to keep. But how about all the dynamic data, or just data, really, essentially, records? Um, this presentation uh, is focused on the use of Ember data because I think that has matured uh, somewhat, and I use it myself, and I've been using it since forever, actually. Uh, so I've experienced quite a few breaks, let me tell you that. Uh, <laughs> Especially the jump from uh, revision four to revision seven, that was terrible. Um, so anyway, we're working under the assumption that we got an Ember setup here using Ember JS and handbars and all that and Ember data. So we got all the static assets cached via the cache manifest, that's nice. And we got dynamic data. We know we wanna work with these using Ember data. Uh, and, th and then what? So yeah, so what are we gonna do about that? Um, 
this is where um, this is where the thinking sort of, at least for me, uh, really starts to kick in because this is where you start you start to realize what what is this offline thing even about? I mean, I mean, what is it comprised of? So, and you start to think. So yeah, so when I when when I find a record, I want to save it locally. That's nice, because then it's saved locally. Yeah. Oh yeah, but okay. So if it's saved locally and I find it, I wanna I wanna return that one first. Uh, and and if it exists locally, and I return the locally stored record, I still wanna I actually still wanna, if possible, uh, reload the record or in some other way figure out if it has changed on the server. Right, so immediately I'll return this promise that resolved to a local record, and I will then proceed to reloading the record. Okay, then I do that. So it, so I show something to the user, like a, a, a status update or whatever. That's great. Now the server returns a response saying this record has actually been deleted. So what the user is seeing is uh, non-existent at this point. This is a very common scenario for a lot of things where you go offline and you go online again at some point. So then you start thinking, what do I do? What do I do? I go get coffee and I just start using turbo links, I guess. No, <laughs> but these are the things that you're, 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 you're bound, to, bound to start thinking of when doing offline mode. So what I'm saying here on um, like overall, I'm saying that no matter um, how, how you approach this, you are going to run into situations that has you or have you um, think about how to treat records in the instance that this or that or this or that has happened to the record. It's, uh, it's the way it is. But then again, you think to yourself, ah, come on. There are so many repositories on GitHub. There's got to be one that deals with this and just that I can just plug in and make everything work. It's got to be possible. Come on. So that's what you think. And then you start uh, crawling uh, GitHub for uh, repositories and you start Googling and you start talking to a lot of people and, and, and you realize that a lot of uh, nice libraries have received funding from the Silla Foundation and whatnot and you think um, one of these has got to be able to do exactly what I want and treat the records in the way that I want. So when you dig into these libraries, you'll find that no, seriously no. None, none of these libraries provide you with a general abstraction that you need for handling records. None of them. And Ember data itself surely doesn't, but we'll get back to the Ember data, the, the linking between that and a library that is able to save to local storage and all that. So then you realize that, okay, no library is going to make this work for me because I got these like edge cases that aren't covered in those libraries. But wait a minute, wait a minute. So. What's the deal here? We got Ember and we got Ember data and that's all fine. And uh, in terms of working with offline uh, uh, records, uh, just things being offline, we got a couple of alternatives that we may want to exploit to their fullest extent or we may not, um, including PouchDB, uh, the, uh, the world famous index DB shim, which is uh, kind of buggy, if you ask me. Uh, the uh, jQuery version of it, which is still kind of buggy. And um, db.js, which is a nice little uh, library for handling these things. And what these libraries will do is abstract away the, um, the API locally uh, of whichever uh, technology is supported, or yeah, well, uh, whichever standard is supported in the browser, because Safari uses WebSQL, for instance, whereas um, Firefox uses IndexedDB. Um, at least Safari so used to. I don't know with the version 7. So we got a bunch of libraries that are able to handle these things for us. So, okay, we got, we got Ember Data with all its find and save and delete record and all that. And uh, let's say that we've focused on using some library. I'm using PouchDB. I'm not using it for the synchronization part or anything. I'm solely using PouchDB because I find that the overall abstraction on top of IndexedDB or whatever is available is uh, uh, working quite well in PouchDB. So um, you've got two choices here, really. Uh, the first one uh, not being pioneered by me, but uh, Eric uh, Brin um, in uh, Ember model. Where, uh, in which he wrote an adapter that um, saved everything to uh, local storage or whatever, IndexedDB, and then 
whatever, did something else, like committed the records. And so if we go the Ember Data adapter way, say we write a custom adapter, how do we do this in practice? We just copy the REST uh, adapter, preferably, and just add in some stuff that ensures that records are saved uh, and that we retrieve them locally before uh, requesting them from the server and stuff like that. That's neat in a way. Uh, it provides, it's gonna, it's gonna end up providing a simple wrapping and, and, and given the fact that it is a simple approach, it's gonna, it's gonna fail silently and stuff like that. So that's great, but what you don't really get here is uh, elaborate error handling and conflict resolution and also querying. Because Ember Data, if you issue a uh, query, that is a find call with uh, a, a JSON object in it, uh, that will result in a query. And Ember Data does not care about um, the, um, well, the actual query payload. It just sends it to the server and expects for the server to respond in some way. But you cannot query the records themselves. Um, it just gets sent through via Ember Data. So you can't really query things. And one more thing. If you put all the local saves and finds and whatnot to uh, index DB or whatever is available in the adapter, you're going to find that it's gonna, not going to be fast. Index DB is actually very slow. Um, local storage is all right, but it's limited to five megabytes, so that doesn't really work for anything besides a funky way of doing cookies. And um, WebSQL is slow as well, so that's, that's really slow. I would say it's not plausible to do like that. But what I came up with um, was the notion or the idea of this like model controller layer. Um, I did that. Well, this is the first reason for that, and that is because uh, having used Ember Data for two years now or so, I've seen it break so many times that I, I didn't want to start writing my own adapter or basic adapter or whatever, only to find out that that would be pulled out of the library uh, a month later and I would have to write all those things all over again. So I want to use Ember Data for offline mode just the way Ember Data is, uh, which I find to be a nice separation of concerns. And, and I will get into what the model control layer is uh, in a moment, but... Um, no, I might as well do that now. Say you have an array controller. You all know that. That's a nice abstraction, right? Um, a controller that um, is able to handle arrays, got the array proxy and got the sortable mix in and everything uh, in it. That's nice. So if you have a controller called app.comments, uh, a model controller, whatever, um, and you put all your comment records in there, you're able to very, very quickly uh, filter records from the array. You're able to very, very quickly find specific records, and 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 uh, yeah, well, and query them well using filter property or, or something like that. But that's a that's a good way of doing it, um, and it's fast. It's way way faster than putting that in the adapter, which is limited anyway. Uh, it's a bit verbose, but I'll get back to that. So, what does this mean in in practice? Um, this means that. So we have an app dot sum root, which is route. Root or route? I never, I never know. What is They're it? Both right. Route? It depends what vector you're in. No, exactly. Okay, I'll say route. <laughs> app sum route. Uh, it has a model, and and what I do is that instead of this model being hooked up directly to Ember Data, uh, it's hooked up to what I, to one of my like model controllers. So this returns. Uh, well, a call to find record in the sum model controller with the given parent, uh, params, sorry. Um, and the controller, that's the interesting part, really. Um, the controller is basically just, as I said, an array controller. So it's got, well, it's got the content. You don't need to type that. That's just for readability here. Um, and it's got the find record uh, uh, function. And as you can see here, the point is here that instead of finding records directly via uh, Ember data, I return a new promise. And what does this do? Well, okay, so first of all, it tries to get the record out of the content uh, array up here via the find property thing. That, that works great, right? And the ID comes from the uh, find record. And if that record exists, then just resolve it. And, and, and that's fine because then the record is present. So if it's not uh, present, then issue a query to uh, PouchDB 
Uh, that's the, this, this is the uh, syntax for that, new PubCDB, some database, whatever. Uh, this would obviously be uh, initialized only once, so this is not pretty, but this is just the basic idea. You would, if the record is not present locally in the controller, you would um, issue a call to PouchDB and you would ask for PouchDB to uh, fetch this record uh, locally. And if it's not present, this is missing from this, but I couldn't fit any more code in here. Um, but if it's not present in PouchDB either, um, obviously you ask Ember Data to fetch the record. And once that promise resolves, well, then it's your job to save the record back to PouchDB or, well, yeah, preferably, and, and, and resolve uh, with the record return from the server. So, all in all, I just need to know which slide is the next one. Yeah, exactly. So, um, essentially working with offline mode because this is such a vast field and, and, and nowhere nearly uh, possible to, to talk about in, in detail in within the a time span of like 60 hours or whatever. Essentially, the idea is to use Ember data as intended, completely as intended, and extend its behavior in a set of controllers. So instead of, again, instead of calling Ember data directly, just wrap it up in, in, a, in a layer of controllers. Why do we have these controllers? Why do we have these? Um, because, come on, this could just be in an adapter. Yeah, primarily it's because of the missing uh, query ability of Ember data, um, querying local records, it's not possible, even if they're loaded in, in, the, in the type map uh, store. Um, that's one reason. And two, again, because of speed. It's way, way faster to um, say you refresh a page and you've got like 200 records um, load, uh, loaded uh, locally. It's way faster to just um, go through all of those initially on page load, put them in the controllers where they belong, and then access them from there uh, in, in the rest of your application. Way faster than asking uh, IndexedDB to pull them out every time. So that's the idea. Um, uh, yeah, so this is just uh, uh, showing how it kind of misses a few, but well, anyway, I got like a bunch of core controllers and that's all great, but I got the model controllers as well down there, activity model, common model, conversation model, whatever, 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 and they all um, extend the array model controller that provides this, these um, general uh, abstractions and um, a set of rules for treating records that have been deleted but are still present locally and things like that. So that's how I chose to uh, structure this. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to read all of these, but uh, obviously, as you can tell, this is, this is quite an elaborate uh, field. Uh, well, essentially, this is a distributed system. If you work with offline mode, you've got a distributed system because you've got two truths, essentially. Um, actually, uh, this is a side note. Let me say that oftentimes this is a problem still when when working purely with offline mode only we are not used to uh, uh, working with this problem because if uh, if if in if in Basecamp I am changing the uh, editing the description of a project and if one of my friends is doing the same and I commit my change and he commits his um, and mine arrives first and then his, his arrives, it just overwrites it with, with, with his change. So that's very opinionated towards last right wins. Whereas when you work with offline mode and distributed systems, things are not that easy. You cannot always um, just assume that last right wins because what if... Um, what if I'm creating a Google Doc locally and, um, no, what if another person has created a Google Doc locally and I am working on that and then I go offline because I sit on the plane, uh, but mind you, nobody's ever offline according to David, but I apparently go offline and sit in the plane and work on this document. Now, in the meantime, um, my friend has deleted this document, so when I get back, what happens when everything gets committed? These things are so important to think about and these things have not yet and will not ever be, I think, um, been abstracted away in, in a library. So there are a lot of things you need to think about here. Be sure to uh, uh, remember, sorry, be sure to return promises and, 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 and stuff. Never use Ember data directly, but always use the corresponding model controller, things like that. Let me, let me give you another example of a problem just to um, elaborate a bit on the scope of this. 
What if you have a list, uh, of, like a paginated list of, of elements and you're showing um, uh, element 0 to 5, uh, offset 0, limit 5, um, and, and, and you go offline and, and, and you go online at some point and, um, and you look up this resource again that has this list of elements. What if all of the elements have been replaced? This is going to be very weird in practice because of somebody else having committed five other elements that are newer and, and are to be shown instead of these. This is going to be very weird in practice because in the UI uh, layer, you're going to ask for, well, no, you're going to see the, the, uh, the five first elements, a page of five elements. But if sorted by when they're created and the newest are shown first and a resulting when you look up the resource call to the server asking about the newest elements results in five new elements being shown essentially you need to to, to change all of the elements shown on that page so things just jump around um some of these uh issues are, are very um yeah very hard to handle uh so that is why offline mode is daunting it is absolutely and there's no easy uh, plug this in solution that'll make it work because uh, it doesn't exist but seriously if this works you guys it's amazing it's so amazing it, it's like I, I, I'm, I'm really serious I think it's amazing it's totally totally amazing to be able to just go to some website and 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 work with all your data even though you're offline I cannot name one app that can do that in in depth at all it's amazing when it works it really is so um, what I'll do is yeah so I will um, I'm launching this uh, piece of software January 1st and what I'll do is I will um, extract away this entire model layer idea um, or extract it out of my um, uh, code and and make it uh, available to everybody and uh, I've made it so that you can define rules yourself so you can say that if two records are in conflict what should happen to either of them and if a record has been deleted but is still present what should happen to it you know things like that so uh, I will well I'm in the process of extracting all that out basically so Working with offline mode uh, perhaps will be the first framework to, to really nail it in, in, a, in a sort of sensible, not tied to a database in the backend uh, way, which is my uh, vision with all this. So uh, I hope this was of some use uh, <laughs> and thank you for having me. Okay, anyone have questions? I have a question. Um, so I'm wondering about um, like how you expire like the local the local storage. Like if, if, if say Twitter, every message when it's loaded from the database from the API yeah. or pushed into this local store, then um, that's gonna get pretty big pretty quickly. So, so yeah, true. Good question. But but yeah, but um, so uh, the minimum. Um, on a, on a mobile phone, the minimum amount of space you're going to get is 50 megabytes. So that's still a lot. You can load a lot of records into that if, if, it's, if it's JSON. Seriously, you can. That being said, it's still a problem. Um, and even though it was like, you can, you can still fill up the space. What I do is I keep track of hits, how many times, or popularity, how many times has a given record been accessed once, and um, the age. So if, if a record has not been accessed for a while, um, for, a, for a long time basically, and some other record is being saved and there is no more space, I kick the, the other record out. That's how I do it, basically. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, because you gotta, that's a compromise. It, 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 you cannot save everything. Yeah, well in Chrome you can. It uses like, it allows for offline uh, data to utilize like 10% of the free space on the, uh, hard drive which is uh, a lot <laughs> so <laughs> you could <laughs> you could pack a lot of Twitter into that but <laughs> Safari is a problem here absolutely um, also, uh, also this um, this just made me think what I do also in terms of Twitter because I I uh, this this has a public um, site to, to it as well so if you have a profile I can view it and see what you publish publicly and so this uh, equals a difference between records that have been loaded in, 
under the circumstance of a person being logged in or records that have been uh, loaded uh, when, when, you know, just publicly, public records. So I actually have a distinction between these two things as well. So configuring this thing is, I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's uh, tricky, but um, there are a lot of details that I really think that I've thought a lot about and support somehow well. So, yeah. That's right. First of all, I was news to me. I didn't realize how slow index DB was. So That's slow. Know that it's worth avoiding. Um, the question I have is: is is that a temporary situation? I mean, or do we? I imagine at some point that problem may get solved. And that, and so the, the two parts of the question are: is do you have any sense on if there's any any movement there? And second of all, were that to happen, would you still favor the solution that you have, or would you want to move towards Um. Well, my impression is that that. Uh, for those who haven't, uh, that the, the, the browser, um, uh, what are they called, vendor producers, uh, Mozilla and, and, and uh, Apple, uh, namely, that they will move to IndexedDB eventually because WebSQL has been deprecated uh, officially. So that's not, um, uh, that's not future proof. And local storage is just out of the question. It's, it's nowhere near uh, usable for, for this amount of data, no. So, but speed is, is essential. It's but, it's, but it sounds like, I mean, maybe I'm, I don't understand the architecture, little reasons why it's so slow, but um, you would, could imagine that in the same way that JavaScript, the performance of JavaScript in the browser has yeah. dramatically gone up, you yeah. can see something similar in the next DB, and you're really getting reasonable performance there. Yeah. Um, I mean, it sounds like, if you, my guess is that's probably a long ways away. And it's the, yeah. yeah. Well. Yeah, it is. Well, first of all, IndexedDB is slow because of the API. So uh, the, the, how you upgrade a database in uh, IndexedDB is by fetching a record, essentially. And um, so you initialize a database uh, with some version. And um, if that version has changed, uh, the reference to that version uh, in JavaScript, um, then when you get a record, you will need to, I can't remember the name of it, but you will need to invoke this, uh, well, it'll happen automatically, so you need to implement an upgrade uh, uh, hook or call in IndexedDB. So um, this check to see if the database needs to be upgraded as a whole happens every time you, you get a, a record out of IndexedDB, and that makes it slow. It does. I don't know why they make the API like that, but they did. So that makes for a very slow database. <coughs> yeah. Which is why it's such a great idea to put the records somewhere else initially. So if you have stored like 2,500 records, put them somewhere else. And if it's enough for you to just load everything and just store, push them into Ember data, that's fine. But if you need way more of a way to locally query the records, put them in controllers and have them make use of the sortable mix in for. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, arranging the content and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Thank you. I have a quick question about the relational features of Ember Data. Do you make use of those? And if, if so, how do you sort of fit them into the? No, I don't. <coughs> I don't make use of them in in the way that, um, at least with the has many uh, relation. No, I actually talked to Yehuda a bunch about this because. It's, it's uh, supposed to, um, it used to actually, but I, I've worked around this, so I don't know if this is still the case, but um, in the beginning, you're, if you had like a record that had, has many of something else, you were supposed to put all the IDs of the records that it has many of inside an array, equaling mm -hmm. a, a, a humongous payload when you fetch that record, because you'll just fetch a record that says name, description, uh, has many, Boom, a big array of IDs, totally inefficient. And um, the has many records that it had many of uh, would then um, be loaded using that array and they would point to, to, to the uh, parent. Uh, I don't use that at all. I use the belongs to keys, but I don't use uh, has many at all because of a change in Ember data in which uh, Yehuda made this sort of two-factor recognition thing in which if you load a uh, belongs to record it'll check if the parent is, is present and it'll just uh, you know make it available um, in, in the uh, you know, whatever the name of like comments so if you get comments you will get all the comments yeah so no I don't do that especially not because I use uh, I got a real hipster stack I use React uh, obviously because 
I need vector clocks when I do this. I got a distributed system, I need to use that. I cannot just do last right wins and everything is all base can't be fine. I need to be a bit more elaborate about this. So I use that and uh, that gets exceptionally slow with um, keys, no not keys, but objects that reach a certain size, 10 kilobytes or something. And they quickly do that if you have an array of a million IDs. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I don't do that. <coughs> But it's not necessary, you know. For people who are interested in starting offline mode but not necessarily going all in, yeah, I mean, in terms of how you think about offline, is there a structural way to kind of dip in, start to take advantage of some capabilities without taking on all the complex things? Yes and no. Um, it, uh, I don't know. It just is complex. It really is. Um, or it can be quickly if, at least if you allow it to be, because again, what I'm saying is a lot of these things we don't think about when we do strictly online apps, but the, the problems that they like uh, are, they still exist. We just don't kind of like, we're just used to uh, PostgreSQL or MySQL just accepting data and just overriding whatever the hell is in there. So um, no, if you, if you do this and you really want for it to work, it's gotta be a bit complex. There, there is no easy way out of this, I'm afraid. And I think also, I asked David this, um, I've asked it twice now, I asked him if offline mode was something that you could plug in and it would just work, trademark, would you then do it? Because I find that's the real issue here. The real issue is not server-generated JavaScript responses and whatever uh, else he conjures up on that blog, no. Um, the real issue, I think, is you don't want to implement it because it's too complicated. And that's fine, but just admit it. That doesn't mean that it's impossible. Not at all. And so that's uh, what I will share with you, hopefully, as soon as possible after the 1st of January. Right. All right. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you.